Welcome, let's get started. So, magical realism. This has become one of my new favorite genres purely because it's one of the most unique literary movements of the last century. To break down the genre, magical realism branches off the bigger genre of realism as it depicts the real world as having an undercurrent of magic or fantasy. Within a work of magical realism, the literary world and setting are still grounded in the real world, but fantastical elements are considered normal in this world. Like fairy tales, magical realism narratives blur the line between fantasy and reality. I want to look a bit about the history of magical realism, and the origins of the term derives from the German term Magischer Realismus, please pardon my German, which was used to describe new objectivity, a style of painting that was popular in Germany, which served as an alternative to the romanticism of expressionism. The image here is an example of a new objectivist painting. This piece presents a realistic scene. A man sits in his chair with a drink and a cigarette nearby. The coloring and lack of exact perspective makes this a new objectivist piece. Now, Marisha Realismus emphasized how magical, fantastic, and strange normal objects appeared in the real world when you stop and look at them, which I think is quite charming. The genre grew popular in South America, such that Latin American authors are credited with making magical realism what it is today. And this was largely due to authors previously writing stories about mundane situations with fantastical elements before magical realism was even a recognized literary genre. Every magical realism narrative is different. But there are certain things they all include, such as realistic settings. All magical realism stories take place in a setting in this world that's familiar to the reader. There are magical elements from talking objects to dead characters to telepathy. Every magical realism narrative has fantastical elements that don't typically occur in our world. However, they're presented as normal within the novel. There's also limited information. Magical realism authors deliberately leave the magic in their stories unexplained in order to normalize it as much as possible and reinforce that it is a part of daily life. Basically, the incredible is presented as being part of normal everyday life. Authors often use magical realism to offer an implicit critique of society, most notably politics and the elite. The genre grew in popularity in parts of the world, like Latin America, that were economically oppressed and exploited by Western countries. Magic realist writers use the genre to express their distaste and critique American imperialism. Finally, there's a unique plot structure. Magical realism does not follow a typical narrative arc with a clear beginning, middle, and end like other literary genres. This makes for a much more intense reading experience, as the reader does not know when the plot will advance or when the conflict will take place. These examples of magical realism novels brilliantly blur the line between fantasy and reality and include magical elements that don't exist in the real world. The most popular one is 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. This is a multi-generational story about a patriarch who dreams about a city of mirrors, then creates it according to his own perceptions. The fluidity of time in this novel is an example of a magical element. Then there's Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie. This is a novel about a boy with telepathic powers because he was born at midnight the same day India became an independent country. There's also The House of the Spirits by Isabella Lende. This is a multi-generational story about a woman with paranormal powers and a connection to the spirit world. There's also Beloved by Toni Morrison, a novel about a former slave haunted by an abusive ghost. The presence of dead characters is an example of a magical element. There's also Like Water for Chocolate by Laura S. Corval. This is a novel about a woman whose emotions are infused in her cooking, causing unintentional effects to the people she feeds. And finally, there's The Wind Up Bird Chronicle by Haruki Murakami. This is a novel about a man searching for his missing cat and eventually his missing wife in a world underneath the streets of Tokyo. 
Magical realism has been a consistently debated topic, and here are two key arguments that will give you something to ponder on. The first is ironic elitism. This debate largely concerns the way magical realism is recognized and classified. Because the lines between magical realism, fantasy, realism, and surrealism are so fuzzy, many critics have argued over whether or not certain writers can even be considered magical realists. For example, the author Alejo Carpentier was the first to bring the term magical realism into Latin American literature. Yet, certain critics have argued over whether or not his work can be classified as magical realism instead of simply fantastical. More so, it comes down to whether a given work should be recognized as literature as opposed to entertainment. Unlike fantasy and commercial fiction, magical realism is considered literary fiction instead of genre fiction, making it more reputable in the academic landscape and more likely to win awards. Now, I find this to be particularly interesting because magical realism is very political in the sense that it implicitly critiques society and particularly critiques the elite because magical realism often tells the stories of people without wealth instead of focusing on the royalty of a region. As a genre, magical realism has been used to critique politics from anti-imperialist, Marxist, feminist, and a combination of all three perspectives. What unites these writers politically is that they wrote from the margins of society, outside of the dominant power structures and central cultural centers. So there is some irony in this situation over what can or cannot be considered good enough to be magical realism or to even be accepted in academic spaces. It reeks of elitism and classism, the very same concept it seeks to critique. The next debate relates to cultural appropriation. There have been cultural debates over magical realism and whether non-Latin American writers have appropriated it. Latin American writers want to claim their movement as the origin, the home, and the only true birthplace of magical realism. When magical realism made the transition from a word in a book in Europe to a literary genre in South and Central America, it also made a transition from a visually responsive genre to politically charged literature. Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the author of 100 Years of Solitude, has said that surrealism comes from the reality of Latin America. He sums up several of the major political issues that stem out of magical realism. The first being that fantasy has always been a part of the Latin American perspective and that magical realism is not a colonial idea from Europe. It also proclaims a nationalistic sentiment that Latin America has a culture, a life and a purpose outside of being a colony. Because magical realism was popularized in countries that had been colonized, scholars see the adoption of magical realism into mainstream literature by commercial writers as cultural appropriation. Now, this is where it becomes a bit tricky. After Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude, magical realism began to be used by writers outside of South and Central America. Salman Rushdie used fantastical elements to tell India's origin story in Midnight's Children. Toni Morrison used added touches of the supernatural to write about the horrors of slavery in America in Beloved. A case could be made that Magical realism also paved the way for later literary movements by underrepresented groups like post-colonial literature and writers like Jean Rhys, Margaret Atwood, and Naguib Mahfouz, who all wrote about finding a national and personal identity in the aftermath of colonial occupation. For all intents and purposes of this presentation, I'm raising this point to bring awareness and a sense of acknowledgement of this issue, as I believe that, like the authors I previously mentioned who were inspired by the literary movement, we too can appreciate the origins of magical realism and adopt the concept of blurring fantasy and reality in our own writing, in a way to appreciate the genre, hopefully when attempting the prompts later on. So, I've mentioned some great examples of magical realism in novels. What about filmmaking? Well, even though magical realism isn't a formal genre of film, there are many beautiful examples nonetheless. To illustrate this, I'd like to draw your attention to one of my favorite directors, who also happens to be Latin American, Guillermo del Toro. The first movie of his I'd like to mention is Pan's Labyrinth. 
The film takes place in Spain five years after the Spanish Civil War, and the young protagonist Ophelia and her terminally ill mother move in with her stepfather, a cruel captain. Forced to grow up in a world of torture and brutality, Ophelia discovers a labyrinth where she meets a fawn. The fantastic elements serve as a parallel to the harsh realist setting she lives in. In the labyrinth's representation of nature and Ophelia's coming of age, these magical elements are used to further the audience's understanding of the story's themes of morality and consequences. The second movie of his I want to mention is The Shape of Water. The film follows the lives of those who could be considered marginalized individuals, with Eliza, a mute woman who works as a cleaner in a government lab at the center of the story. The film takes place in ordinary Baltimore around 1962, despite the presence of the amphibian man that is brought into the government lab with whom Eliza comes to fall in love. By introducing this foreign creature to the audience and allowing us to see him as Eliza does, we come to see the common oppression of the other with new eyes and what it means to love someone for who they truly are. Another great example from a Mexican director is Alejandro G. Iñárritu's Birdman, which follows a faded actor, Regan Thompson. He is best known for his role as the beloved superhero Birdman, a character that constantly haunts him as he tries to reestablish his glory in a more respected way through his own Broadway production. The elements of magical realism can mostly be found through Riggins' connection to his superhero past, a character who becomes his alter ego of sorts. There are moments in the film where Riggins physically transforms into Birdman, which helps to communicate the inflated sense of ego and narcissism that overtakes the character. And finally, while Edgar Wright's lovable Scott Pilgrim vs. the World might not immediately come to mind as a typical example of magical realism, it most definitely can be considered as such. Based on a series of comic books, the film follows Scott Pilgrim on his mission to win the heart of Ramona Flowers. But in order to do so, he must defeat her seven evil exes. It features hyperbolic humor and video game stylization. For example, if Scott defeats one of Ramona's exes, they physically turn into a pile of coins. While many surrealist and fantastical elements are utilized, they are used to emphasize the film's realist theme of idealization in romance. Now that we are equipped with the necessary background, breakdown, and examples of magical realism, how do we go about writing it? Well, here are some tips. Firstly, you should choose a realistic setting. Magical realism is set in the everyday world, so you should choose a setting for your story that is based on an actual location. You shouldn't create a new world for your story. If you want to create your own town or place, it should be modeled after a real place with buildings and people that you might find elsewhere. The setting can be at any time in history, however, it should not be in the future, which would be considered a fantasy setting. You should also define a thematic event. To guide your story, you can first decide on a thematic event that will influence the plot. For example, in the short story, A Very Old Man with Enormous Wings by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, a man is discovered with tattered wings. The rest of the story focuses on the character's reactions to the man and how he influences their lives. Similarly, you can choose one fantastical or extraordinary event to guide the rest of the action in your story. The main event should reflect a theme, such as change or faith. You should also create reflective happenings. Many times, the miraculous or amazing things that happen in magical realism reflect the emotions of the characters or the theme of the story, like metaphors. The difference is that these are events and not just descriptions. For example, in Like Water for Chocolate by Laura Esquivel, the main character cooks dishes that cause those who eat them to feel what she's feeling. So if she's feeling amorous when she cooks, they soon begin feeling amorous as well. You can infuse your story with these types of reflective events instead of one controlling thematic event. And finally, you can experiment with time. Time is not always linear in magical realism. There can be great shifts in the narrative timeline. A single moment can be made to feel like 100 years or vice versa. The story can jump around without the use of flashbacks or flash forwards. Characters don't necessarily time travel, although that can be an element of magical realism, but their stories don't have to be told 
on a single timeline. Here are some common conventions you can adapt and use when crafting your own magical realism narratives. The narratives can become self-reflexive metafiction. People in authority in the fictional world typically affect the characters' lives, sometimes as antagonists, sometimes as the political system in the background. Different times mix into one and the story becomes merged with reality as if it were not fiction at all, making the reader or listener question what's around them and rethink their experiences. This way of thinking expands the sense of what is possible. The narrative style is dense with vivid detail, as in the paintings associated with the name, gently whimsical with positive views toward nature. Your narrative can feature multiple conflicting points of view. Time flows both ways and may even be circular. Things can be fated to occur or be influenced by desire, by the future, by agreements before birth, or by native ritual intent. The paranormal things people can do are considered the result of spiritual maturity, such as telepathy, telekinesis, clairvoyance, shape-shifting, entering dreams, and living without food or sleep. The political arena is highly charged with the brutality of colonialism. The ending doesn't generally tie everything up in a bow. The narrator doesn't disclose everything, keeping the sense of mystery that makes us pay close attention. The narrator also doesn't get upset when out of this world things happen, nor do they dismiss them or try to explain them. Instead, they allow the reader to inhabit the expansive possibilities, but doesn't directly state their beliefs about them. Finally, remember that this isn't about creating an imaginary world where anything goes. It's about capturing the sensation of living with observation, colored by the sense of possibilities beyond limitations that are considered the scientific boundaries. So it's good to remain logical within those chosen limits. There is a much more expansive list of these conventions, as well as some fabulous writing techniques that I didn't mention that you can employ when attempting to write magical realism narratives. You can find them on this website that I will link in the description box. In conclusion, what is perhaps most important to recognize about magical realism is that it shows us the creative ways in which stories can help us to better understand the very world we live in. In an odd way, it makes sense. Sometimes we need something completely unfamiliar to help shift our perspectives. As these stories continue to be told, perhaps they will make our own world feel just a little more magical. For prompts, I have a list of very detailed scenarios that you can use as is or adapt to your liking. I'll read them out quickly. A writing society consisting of university students meet one fateful night only to discover their hidden ability to rewrite reality. After a young man is killed as an innocent bystander in the crossfires of gang violence, you notice a mysterious symbol appear on the side of a building. As the new housekeeper for a prominent wealthy family, one of your tasks is to water all of the house plants. You are watering the lilies in the entryway when one of the plants starts talking to warn you of a dark family secret. You are at a coin show when you meet a coin dealer who specializes in collecting mythical currencies. After centuries of a smaller cult family developing successful potions for love, fortune, and health, the oldest son decides to launch the family business of magic into the corporate world. After moving to a new town, a family thinks they found the perfect home. That is, until the walls begin to talk. After a few too many songs come on the radio at random coincidence, you realize you have a gift to communicate with spirits through music. You stare at the person in the photo and wonder what their life might have been like. Next thing you know, you and the person in the photograph have swapped places. Your character crash lands on an island and begins the grueling tasks of securing food, shelter, and making repairs. What appears to be a series of coincidences to the stranded explorer is actually the island-sized organism enthusiastically showing hospitality to its first guest in a long time. It's just one of those silly mood rings, or is it? Every night you are awakened by the sound of a train, but the railroad closed down years ago. I hope you learned something new. Good luck and happy writing. Thank you for watching and listening to this presentation brought to you by Ink Society. Think, write, create.